Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, dear students. Welcome to my class. This is lecture number 16. In this lecture, titled Administration under the British, we will be discussing the three main pillars of the British administration in India. The three pillars of the British administration in India were none other than the civil service, army and the police. These pillars were used by the British for the foundation as well as for strengthening British administration in India. The aim of the British administration was maintenance of law and order. Second, continuation of the British rule. These were the two main intentions behind the British administration in India. The civil service, army and the police through which the British maintained and continued the British administration in India. Let us discuss one by one. First of all, we will be discussing the civil service development and uh, how it causes the strengthening of the British administration in India. Among the three pillars of the British administration in India, first of all let us discuss civil service. The aim of civil service was to translate law into action as well as the collection of revenue. For these two purposes, Civil service was used by the English East India Company initially. Laws were codified. The maintenance of this law and order was vested with the civil service. While the interpretation of the law was vested with the judiciary. With this civil service machinery, the British collected land revenue. And when did the English East India Company use the term civil service? And in what connotation they began to use the word civil service? The civil service was used in the English East India Company records to demarcate or to separate the civilian employees of the English East India Company working in military and ecclesiastical counterparts for the purpose of demarcation or the separation of the civil employees from the military and ecclesiastical employees the term civil service began to be used by the English East India Company. However, the separation of the civil servants who engaged in civil matters, only the military personnel and the ecclesiastical personnel engaged in military matters and religious matters. But these civil servants they engaged in civil matters and in order to separate them from the military and religious counterparts, the where civil service was first used in the official records of the English East India Company. It was initially only in commercial nature. Initially, the civil servants engaged in the commercial affairs of the English East India Company, but later from the commercial activities, they transformed into a public service. 
in 1675 even before the establishment of the political rule in bengal through the battles of plassey and the battles of bexar a gradation of posts were created by the english east india company the service commences as apprentices from the apprentices promotion was made to the post of writers from the writers they were promoted to factors from the factors promotion was made to junior merchants and from junior merchants promotion was made to senior merchants this was the official hierarchy the english east india company created a person started his career as apprentices and then rose to the position of the senior merchants by going through different posts the term civil servant began to be used in the official records of the english east india company in 1765 with the diwani rights the english brought from the nawab of bengal through the treaty of allahabad from the senior merchants the civil servants got the opportunity for appointment to higher services including the governor including the governor was appointed from among the civil servants who had vast experience working in india and this situation continued till 1839 then who did make appointment to the civil service whether there existed any open competitive examination for recruitment to the civil service the answer is exactly no they were the civil servants were appointed by the court of directors it was through the system of patronage it was not a direct open competitive examination the civil servants were recruited but under the system of patronage the civil servants were nominated by the court of directors there were 24 directors in the court of directors they were initially elected on an annual basis by the shareholders of the english east india company and these 24 directors of the court of directors enjoyed patronage and they nominated most of the time their kins and kith to the coveted position of the civil service there was no open competitive examination or merit system of civil service in india initially under the english east india company since the recruitment was made not based on merit substandard persons assumed the posts of civil service and once these civil servants were appointed through the process of nomination they indulged in corrupt bribery and illegal private trade through the treaty of allahabad and before it in 1717 farooq siyar he was the mughal emperor 
In 1717, Farooq Siyar, the Mughal emperor, granted duty pass free or the exemption from the payment of customs taxes. It came into known as Dastaga or duty free pass. It was granted only to the English East India Company. <coughs> but these nominated civil servants, they used this Dastaga or duty free pass for the purchase of goods from Bengal without paying customs taxes. So, they engaged these officials, their attention was to only amass huge wealth rather than a running and efficient system of administration by corrupt practices, bribery and engaging in illegal trade, these civil servants amassed huge wealth and sent it to Britain. And it was the practice during the period of dual government from 1765 to 1772. In 1765, Robert Clive introduced a dual system and it continued till 1772 during the period of Warren Hastings. And during this period, the civil servants engaged in private trade, bribery, and corrupt practices because none of them were appointed by their own merit. All of them were the nominees of the court of directors. Warren Hastings wants his appointment led the foundation of the civil service in India. But it was Lord Cornwallis, he reformed. His period was Lord Cornwallis period was from 1786 to 1793 was the period of Lord Cornwallis and the Warren Hastings period was from 1772 to 1785. This was the period of Warren Hastings. Cornwallis period was from 1786 to 1793. Even though the foundation of Civil service was made by Dalhousie, sorry, Warren Hastings. It was reformed and modernized by Lord Cornwallis. Warren Hastings is the foundation of civil service, but Lord Cornwallis reformed, modernized, and rationalized it. That is why Lord Cornwallis came to be known as the father of civil service in India. He introduced covenanted civil service for higher civil service. It was different from un uncovenanted civil service. Uncovenanted civil service was subordinate civil service. Covenanted civil service was higher civil service. The covenanted or higher civil service was created through an act of the English East India Company. While the uncovenanted civil service was not created based on the law passed by the English East India Company. It was a subordinate civil service. Most of the time, Indians were appointed to this subordinate or uncovenanted civil service. And now, we have seen that it was Warren Hastings who laid the foundation of the civil service and Lord Cornwallis rationalized, reformed and modernized it. It was the period of Warren Hastings. In 1772, he created the post of district collector. When Warren Hastings created the post of district collector, they were invested with two important duties. One, collection of revenue and administration of justice. These were the two duties discharged by the district collector during the period of Warren Hastings. In 1786, water revenue was created in Bengal. Water revenue was created to supervise the district collector. Yes. Supervision 
supervision of district collector in the collection of land revenue. And it was during the period of Lord Convalis, Indians were not appointed to the covenanted or the higher civil service. These higher civil service were exclusively reserved for the Britishers. Why did Lord Convalis exclude Indians from the appointment of higher services? Because he was doubtful about the integrity and the ability of the Indians. It was the one of the reasons why Lord Convalis excluded Indians from appointing higher posters of the civil service. Second reason was that the consolidation of the British power should not left to the hands of the natives of India. So the consolidation of power was it to be done by the British officials. It was for possible for the Indians to consolidate the British power. It was the second reason why Lord Cornwallis excluded Indians from the coveted covenanted civil service of the English East India Company. Thirdly, he wanted this lucrative post for the influential class of the British society by engaging bribery, corruptive practices and private trade. After retirement, this civil service landed in Britain with immense wealth of Bengal and following which this landed gentry and the British influential class competed with each other to get British appointments in Indian territories. So, these appointments were highly lucrative. So, it was during the period of Warren Hastings and before which under the period of dual government introduced by Robert Clive. These civil servants engaged in bribery, corrupt practices in addition to illegal private trade and amassed huge wealth. But Cornwallis, when he came into power, decided to end the bribery, corruptive practices and illegal trade existed among the civil servants. He imposed certain restrictions on the civil servants forbidding them to engage in corrupt bribery as well as illegal private trade. He forbade private trade. The civil servants of the English East India Company were banned, banned from engaging in private trade. And in order to compensate the losses arised out of the banning of the private trade, Lord Cornwallis increased the salaries of the civil servants. The salary of the district collector was raised to 1,500 per month. In addition to 1,500 rupees per mensum, the district collectors were also given 1% commission from the revenue they collected. If they collected 100 rupees, 1 rupee was given as commission to the district collectors. No doubt, during this time, it was one of the highest paid service across the globe, 1,500 rupees per mensum was one of the highest paid service. Even after giving this high salary and one person commission to the civil servants, they continued to engage in corruption and existed inefficiency because 
the recruitment was made not based on merit it was under the patronage system the court of directors nominated their kin and kith to the coveted post of civil service to work in india after lord cornwallis his spirit also witnessed the end of the corrupt practices or bribery or the engagement of officials in private trade lord wellesley took significant steps in the direction he decided to introduce suitable training for civil servants in india the earlier civil servants had not given any kind of training in how to run the administration or the history culture of the india but it was lord wellesley who decided to introduce training for civil servants in order to improve the efficiency of the civil servants as well as to root out the corrupt practices of the civil servants two types of training was planned by lord wellesley one foundation training foundation training was to be provided in britain it was to be followed by further training it was to be provided in india and for the purpose of giving training to the civil servants in india fort william college was founded at calcutta on 24 november 1800 this college was founded in calcutta to provide training to the civil servants in which subjects the civil servants were provided training they got a training in literature science languages in india as well as the local customs and history of the country were also taught but the establishment of the fort william college for providing training to the civil servants was not favored by the court of directors so the court of directors did not approve the establishment of the fort william college at calcutta following which the fort william college at calcutta was abolished in 1802 and after the abolition of the fort william college in 1802 east india college was founded it was founded in helibury in britain in 1806 in 1806 east india college was founded in helibury in britain to provide training to the civil servants still uh, the training was introduced for the civil servants the method of recruitment was same what was the method of recruitment it was the patronage patronage system it was enjoyed by the court of directors who nominated members to the civil service the most of the time nominated their sons or nephews as civil servants of the english east india company in 1829 another development took place in civil service it was the creation of the office of the divisional commissioner about district collector he was the link between the province and the district divisional commissioner was created about the post of district collector in 20, 1829 it was created during the period of william bendick charter act of 1833 was an important clause with regard to the recruitment to civil services the charter act of 1833 argued that the civil services and other posts of the english east india company would be opened to all 
Indians as well as the Britishers without any distinction based on religion, caste and community for the barrier of recruitment was now removed with the passage of the Charter Act of 1833. This clause was included in the Charter Act of 1833 at the instance of William Bendick. However, by the passage of the Charter Act of 1833, these posters in civil service were opened to the Indians as well. It was only a limited competition. How did it work? The court of directors was the first to nominate four times the number of civil servants required. Earlier, all the servants were nominated by the court of directors. Now, a change took place. Under the changed scenario, the court of directors would nominate four times higher the number of civil servants required. Then these nominated candidates were to go through a competitive examination based on which the recruitment was made to the civil service. Whatever may be, one fourth of the candidates nominated by the court of directors got appointment to the civil service. So, in even though through the Charter Act of 1833 opened the civil service posters to the Indians, Indians did not get appointment because still the system of patronage in an another form was continued by the Court of Directors. So, the demand for open competition was started, but with the passage of the Charter Act of 1853, it ultimately took away the patronage power of the Court of Directors once for all. In 1854, the English East India Company appointed a committee with Thomas, ba Thomas Babington Macaulay as the chairman to frame rules for recruitment to the civil services containing the qualifications as well as the method of recruitment. However, Macaulay submitted his report in 1854. No action was taken on the report submitted by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Even though Macaulay submitted his report to the Board of Control, still the system continued. But only in 1858, after the rebellion of 1857, through the Queen Victoria Proclamation of 1858, the British decided to open a civil service to the Indians and the civil servants were to be recruited based on the open competitive examination and based on the performance in the open competitive examination, the merit list was to be prepared and the recruitment to, service, to the civil service was to be made. And this was decided only in 1858 after the rebellion of 1857. In the same year, Hellebury College was abolished in 1858 and from 1858 the civil servants began to give on training in British universities. However, through the Queen Victoria Proclamation of 1858, 
the civil service was appointed to indians however the civil service act was passed only in 1861 civil service act civil service act was passed only in 1861 however civil service was opened to the indians only a few indians would enter into this coveted civil service because the competitive examination was held far away in london secondly the questions were heavily based on the knowledge of latin greek and english indians were unfamiliar with these languages and again when it was introduced in 1858 the upper age limit was 23 the minimum age limit was 19 but it was during the period of lord lipton the upper age limit was reduced from 23 to 21 the so at the young age between 19 and 23 after studying latin greek english the aspirant was it to go from india to britain to compete with the britishers in the civil services examination that is why only a few indians got selected to this coveted civil services examination they served as the control officer as well as the district at the district level the district collector was the head of the revenue administration in addition to the collection of revenue the district collector also discharged magisterial and judicial duties during the period of hastings warren hastings but it was during the period of lord cornwallis he separated the judicial and magisterial powers from the district collector and it was given to a new functionary of district judge and in the district the district collector discharged the duty of revenue collection and discharged some kind of judicial and magisterial functions as well it was during the period of cornwallis the judicial functions got separated from the district collector in running the administration of the district district collector was helped by an officer called tahsildar tahsildar belonged to uncovenanted civil service most of the time this post was given to an indian in 1831 the officers of the magistrate and the local chief of police were also transferred to him in larger district between the collector and tahsildar another post was also created that is deputy collector this post was created in 1831 during the period of william bendick he created the post deputy collector in larger district in between district collector and the tahsildar most of the time indians were appointed as deputy collectors it was an uncovenanted post now from civil service now we go to study and discuss how the army functioned under the english east india company most of the soldiers of the english east india company were indians in an estimate made in 1857 86% of 
of the army man was Indian. In 1857, the total strength of the army men was 3,11,400. It was the total strength of the army personnel in the English East India Company of which 2,65,900 army personnel were Indians. Why did the Indians form the large chunk of the army of the English East India Company? There were certain reasons behind the appointment of Indians in large numbers in the army of the English East India Company because employing the Britishers as army men in English East India Company was highly expensive. More salaries were required to be paid to the British army men while most of the time Indians were paid only one third of the salary given to British soldier. Company was it to maintain a huge standing army, not only to fight against the Indian rulers, but also to fight against the European rivals like the French and the Dutch, as well as for his colonial purposes in other parts of Asia and Africa. A huge standing army was required for the British to maintain. So, by employing the Britishers, it was highly expensive to maintain such a huge standing army. That is why most of the lower posters of the army were given to Indians. But Indians were not appointed in the higher posters of the army. All the commissioned posts of the army were managed by the Britishers. Indians were not appointed to the commissioned ranks of the army, that is, to the post of lieutenant, or colonel, or captain, or major. All these posters were grabbed by the Britishers as a matter of right. Indians were appointed at the lowest level of civilians. Even with the great fighting capacity and the value, the Indians could rise only up to the post of Subedar. All other higher posters were managed by the Britishers. For example, in 1856, only three Indian Indians received a salary of 300 rupees per mensum. And there were other reasons as, as well for the appointment of Indians because the population in Britain was too small to provide such a huge standing army in India for its colonial purposes in India and outside as well as to fight against the European rival powers like the French and the Dutch. Most of the Shibais of the English East India Company came from present day Uttar Pradesh and Bihar then formed the Out region. In Out, in 1857, there were 75,000 soldiers were from Out. Most of these sepoys joined the services of the English East India Company as sepoys in order to supplement their fast declining agricultural income because of the introduction 
of the revenue settlements by the British. Under the new revenue settlement, the British collected high amount of tax leading to decline of income from agriculture. That is why most of these young people from these peasant families joined the services of the English East India Company as she boys. And most of them belonged to upper caste from this out. And with this army men recruited from India, the interesting fact was that most of the part of India was captured by the British. With these Indian sea boys, the British able to capture most of the dominions and territories in India. In addition to that, this Indian army was also used for its colonial purposes outside India. Well, there were certain grievances to these Indian sea boys. These Indian sea boys were not allowed to wear caste mark. Chaplains were maintained in the army at the government cost for converting Hindu and Muslim Shibois into Christianity. These Shibois, Indian Shibois were paid only 79 rupees per mensum. But the British Shibai was given 27 rupees per mensum. Out of these 79 rupees, the Indian Shibai had to meet the expenses arise out of uniform, transport of private baggage and food. And since most of the Shibai boys belong to the upper caste, crossing the sea or black water was considered as loss of caste by these upper caste sea boys. But the British had forced these sea boys to cross seas for its colonial purposes outside the country. In 1856, General Service Enlistment Act was passed. Under this, a very new, new recruitee was required to enter into a bond with the British government that they would serve overseas if required by the British government. After the rebellion of 1857, changes were introduced in the army. Now we are going to see what changes the British introduced in the army after the Great Rebellion of 1857. The army in Auth, Central India and Bihar were declared non-martial because most of the Shibais of Auth, Central India and Bihar raised the banner of revolt in 1857 against the British. While Sikhs, Gorkhas and Padans, they supported the British in the suppression of the rebellion of 1857. So these Sikhs, Gorkhas and Padans were declared martial and the army in out Central India and Bihar declared as non-martial because of their participation in the rebellion of 1857 against the British. After the rebellion of 1857, the number of British soldiers increased. The ratio between British and Indian soldier in Bengal army to which the Auth belonged. It was at the ratio of 1 is to 2. When one British soldier was recruited, two Indian soldiers were recruited in British or in Bengal army. While the ratio was 2 is to 5 in Madras and Bombay armies, when two European soldier or British soldier was recruited, five Indians were recruited in Bombay and Madras armies. Following which 
the number of European troops increased from 45,000 in 1857 to 65,000 after the rebellion. The number of Indian troops reduced from 2,38,000 to 1,40,000 after the rebellion. And the key geographical places and strategically important areas began to be controlled by the British soldiers only. Indians were excluded from controlling key geographical and strategical areas. Again, the Indian Sipahis were not allowed to enter into artillery. During the rebellion of 1857, these Indian soldiers took away arms from the artillery and used it against the British. Following which, it was decided not to allow the Indian Sipahis to enter into artillery. All higher posters were exclusively reserved for the British. And the British also made, after the rebellion of 1857, to prevent the development of nationalist feelings among the Indian soldiers by preventing the reach of newspapers and periodicals to soldiers. Now coming to the police. One more change was also introduced in the army by the British, that is the policy of divide and rule. After the rebellion of 1857, the policy of divide and rule were introduced by the British in the army. Under this system, in order to prevent the development of solidarity among the soldiers belonging to different religion, divide and rule policy was introduced. Separate regiments and battalions were created consisting of the persons to the same religion or same community. For example, if a Sikh religion, no, a Sikh regiment, in the Sikh regiment only persons belonging to Sikh community were recruited. And in Gurkha, Gurkhas started to join the services of the English East India Company as mercenaries from 1815. These Gurkhas began to join the services of the English East India Company. And Gurkha and the Sikh regiments were created. These regiments were began to create only consisting of the persons belonging to the same religion. It was to prevent the development of solidarity and it was the another practice introduced by the uh, British after the rebellion of 1857 in the army. Why did the British introduce this policy of divide and rule? If, for example, if Hindu community revolted in one place, the British would not send Hindu regiment to suppress them, instead of which they would send Gurkha regiment. If the Hindu regiment would send, the British feared that these soldiers would join with the community and fight against the British. And in order to prevent this, the British introduced the policy of divide and rule in the army. Now coming to the third pillar of the British administration in India, it was none other than the police system. Before the arrival of the British, Semintars enjoyed police power and they maintained land order. 
but this Semindas discharged their duties with the utmost nepotism and corruption. And even when the dual system of government was introduced in Bengal in 1765 after acquiring power in Bengal by the British from the Nawab of Bengal in 1765 through the Treaty of Allahabad. No change was made in the police functions. During the dual system of government, the responsibility of the maintenance of land order was vested with the Nawab of Bengal. But the collection of land revenue was made by the British. So, there were two functionaries, one English East India Company and another one the government of Nawab. That is why this system came in known as dual system, one by government by the company and another by the Nawab of Bengal. The Nawab of Bengal did not have money, but he was responsible for the maintenance of land order. While on the other hand, all powers were vested with the English East India Company, but it did not take up the responsibility of maintenance of land order. And this period of dual government witnessed its high crimes rate across Bengal. And during the period of Warren Hastings, he did not make much change. He introduced, uh, reformed the system. How did this reform the system? Magistrates were appointed above the Semindars. The Semindars continued to enjoy police powers. But they were placed below the English magistrates. This system was introduced only in 1781. This system came into known as Fauchidari system. It was introduced by Warren Hastings in 1789. Sorry, 1781. In 1781, this system was introduced in Bengal. Under this system, the Semindars still enjoyed the police powers and above these Semindars, magistrates were appointed for the maintenance of land order. But it was during the period of Lord Cornwallis, a police system was created. He took away the police powers of the Semindars and disbanded their army. Lord Cornwallis disbanded the army of the Semindars. And the police force was made completely at the command of the English East India Company. And for the ad police administration, Tane was created. Tana was headed by an officer called Daroga. Each district got divided into a number of Tanas. Each Tana was headed by an officer called Daroga. Daroga was an Indian officer. When each district got divided into a number of Tanas, each Tana was placed under an officer called Daroga. This system came into known as Daroga system. This Thanas was initially under the control of the district judge and this system was initially introduced in Bengal but later it extended to Madras in 1802 during the uh, period of Wellesley. Later the district judge lost the control over the Darogas and this the post district superintendent of police was created as the head of the district police system. But in 1812, this Daroga system was abolished by the British. And finally, it was handed over the district collector. The main task of the police force was to handle criminals and to prevent the conspiracy against the British rule. And later, 
this police force was mainly mobilized by the British for the suppression of the national movement. In police department also Indians were not appointed to the higher posters. It was during the period of Lord Cornwallis decided all higher posters having salary of 500 or more only be given to Englishmen. After 1813 under Hastings, the Indianization of the lower branches of service, mainly the judiciary started. Bendik also advocated the inclusion of the Indians, at least at the subordinate services. In order to reduce the expenses, William Bendik made appointments of Indians to the lower and subordinate services. These are the major questions from this topic. Explain the evolution of civil service in British India and what were the grievances of the Indian boys in the army of the English East India Company. Thank you students for watching this class. Thank you. Understanding oneself, understanding others, understanding society at large, understanding the nature, these are all driven by basic human curiosity. We would all love to understand why things happen, what happens, what is the final outcome, why certain things fail. These are all exercises that we perform in various domains of knowledge. Therefore, knowledge in various domains you would realize they are actually social artifacts. They have to be rooted into historical perspective, they have to be culturally salient and there would be socio-political reasons behind this. Whether you talk with respect to engineering sciences, whether you talk with respect to physical sciences, biological sciences, social sciences, that is the reason why humanities and social sciences should be understood by all of us. The knowledge that is segregated, that is divided with respect to areas, specializations, all of them needs to be understood in its context. And what provides the context? It is the social reality. How do you correlate knowledge in a given domain with the cultural reality, with the social reality? with the socio-political compulsions. Okay, how do you understand the law of nature okay, in its totality? And for doing that, you require the understanding of humanities and social sciences. Say for instance, if you are trying to understand the effect of a particular bacteria, a virus, any microbe, how it affects behavior, how it affects the organism, human being. You start looking at it from a pure biological point of view. If you are trying to look at a particular type of a wavelength, say for example, you are emphasizing on the understanding of the effect of radiation on human life. You are looking at things from a physical point of view. You are looking at the corresponding changes inside the body. You are looking at the physiological side of the uh, understanding of the information. You are trying to understand why despite knowing the risk that is inbuilt in the process, why still human beings engage into it. You are looking at it from a pure behavioral point of view. Why society at large admire things which has full of risk. You are trying to understand things from a pure sociological point of view. Why people use particular uh, set of words to explain those experiences. You are trying to understand things from the linguistic point of view. So, there are whole lot of things and then finally, you try to combine all of them to say that 
what are the guiding principles in life, then you say you are looking at life, you are looking at humanity from a pure philosophical point of view. And this is what social sciences courses provide you. They provide the context to you in which you would be finally positioning the understanding of the knowledge in any given domain. It could be engineering, it could be sciences, it could be medical sciences, it could be social sciences stuff, it could be humanities stuff. So, con contextualizing the knowledge is what humanities social science courses help you obtain.